Welcome to Soft Bites Podcast. Your life, your dentistry. We talk about ways to have more fun and meaning in one of the coolest and most rewarding professions in medicine. Conversations on how to bring awareness, create a healthy workplace, and provide emotional insights to make dentistry a fulfilling activity while making space for one's wonder, creativity, and freedom. Here are your hosts, Manuela and George Andre. I'm very connected with, uh, with education and stuff, but even still, I have to admit that I was more... I think I was... Uh... I don't know if it's up to date is the best word, but I find it more difficult to be up to date now uh, than when I was 30. And I think that part of that has to do with my ego, with my experience slash but, ego. That's, that's, that's <laughs> clinical expertise and self-confidence are different things. Different things, I exactly. Think. Yeah. Different things. But the thing, okay. yeah, the thing is, that, but, yeah, but the problem is that sometimes when, when you are clinically success, successful you tend to believe that you are like the the superstar right and that that's yes. a, that's a that's a dangerous place to be and the, I, I mean I, I i tried to to think about that but uh but yeah I, I i think that yes my clinical confidence and my clinical expertise in the fields that i feel confident of course they are better but I think it's very easy to go to the other side, which is be extremely, um, extremely certain of many things, and uh, yeah, that's and that's what I think that ego has a lot to do with that ego or, or excess of of, of self confidence. Yeah, but, it, but it's very interesting what you said that that uh, uh, experience will bring you to um, to better diagnose. There's 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 a passage on Le, um, on Loban Thun's book that he, he that he said that um, uh, the child's mother has always a better diagnosis in in pediatrics than the first year internship specialty doctor. It's very interesting. He says, yeah, they know. For the first, yeah, it's very interesting, right? So experience is really, really, really something. That is uh, that is important. So 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 far, what what we realize is that evidence based dentistry is something that you can always rely if you have a doubt. Uh, no matter what the environment that you are, no matter how experienced, no matter how the younger you are, you can always rely on evidence based dentistry tools to make the best choices for patients. And and here information is key, right? Patient information is really. And, and and if you are a little bit trapped, you can always rely on the motto of, I mean, you have to inform the patient of what's the best possibilities. And I think that's um, that that's a good take-home message. Um, another thing, um, I mean, there's a lot of research, and 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 you've been on on the research field for many decades. I mean, you've been. I'm certain that you are like a, a referee, in many magazines and stuff. Um, I get all the time emails of new journals popping up. Uh, there's a lot of even social media apps for researchers. You, you get emails every day to, tr to, 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 to publish in this journal and to publish in that journal. Um, so so what is, is there a financial interest behind that? And don't you think there's also an, an excess of research? And is all this research actually useful? And you, you, you've talked a little bit about this, but... Do do you also have this point of view? There's sometimes there's this pressure just to publish, just for publishing, and maybe there's some sort of interest behind that. And is that actually clinical helpful? Clinically helpful for 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 dentistry? Yeah, that's a very good question because this is really a hot topic. Uh, we are facing today uh, the the first decades of the evidence paradigm were about. Uh, trying to screen the evidence that exists, trying to distill it, separate what's good from bad. And everything was about the quality of the evidence. Is the evidence, does this evidence have quality? Uh, is it good enough? Uh, the appraisal papers are very centered on um, what is the quality of this paper. It's good quality or it's a bad quality paper. But now we are turning to another, we are 
turning to another problem that emerged from, from there is, uh, we have, uh, we are learning and we are finding in this 21st century that um, despite the fact of having quality, much of the research and clinical research that is uh, undertaken has no use at all for clinical decision. No use at all. This is called, this problem is called the study of the waste. So we talk a lot about, we live in the wasting world. We waste resources, we waste everything. And this is called research waste. This concept is called research waste because every time you're doing research, somebody's paying for it. That's the first concept. There is not free research. Free re research costs a lot of money. So when you are doing research that has quality, but at the end of the day is the repetition of uh, 300 other studies that I have been doing just alike. And we are studying things, uh, spending lots of money to do high quality research, but that in fact will not have any use for clinical decision. So that should concern us as taxpayers and as, uh, and this, this um, happens because of many factors. One of the factors is the, the fact that you have many publications today from where to choose from. And many of them have arisen as uh, what we call now the, the, the open access publications. And these publications, well, I'm putting aside predatory uh, institutions, okay, of publishing, of publishers, okay? So I get like 10 invitations a, a day in my email to go to this conference that will not exist or to publish in this journal that uh, uh, has no peer and good peer reviewing at all. So we'll put those aside. And let's stay, for instance, with open access publications which are quite new concept that is developing very much in the in the past years uh, and uh, over traditional publications. Uh, the, these publications have a, a reason because uh, it was it was very difficult at the point of time it is or nowadays it is very difficult to publish in classical journals what we call the and uh, this uh, introducing this in, introduces a sense of frustration in researchers uh, when you have peer reviewers that uh, one is the good cop the other one is the bad cop that always happens some when you have somebody saying this paper is very good and the other reviewers say, no, this paper is very bad. And uh, so there's a problem with peer reviewing. Peer reviewing is not paid. Uh, and there is something very strange happening in these classical journals, which is uh, once again, have the evidence-based paradigm has enabled the uprising of uh, editorial systems that guide the author to construct their publication, what we call constructing a good reporting, because you can have a good result with a good with a good research, but you having a bad reporting, not reporting appropriate, appropriately. And so journals have this the prismas and the consorts. There are now many systems that the editors uh, oblige the, the, the researchers to follow when they want to report their papers with checklists saying you have to have this, you have to have that. But they, they don't provide it to the reviewers or they don't force the reviewers to use those same objective appraisal and guiding systems. So peer reviewing is still much done ad libitum. It is done upon the will of the reviewer. And uh, so this, uh, and it's very strict and it's very uh, unlogical sometimes. And, uh, and it's, it's bad. 
it's badly done from the scientific point of view because when you have a uh, you you cannot have two teachers teachers appraising or marking the same exam and coming to different grades so i can to the how can two different uh reviewers that claim to do it objectively and scientifically come to completely different opinions about the same paper. And this is very frustrating. And this enabled an industry to flourish, which was an industry that's saying, okay, uh, we can speed this up for you. We can simplify this for you. Uh, and uh, if you if you pay for your paper, uh, we, we will make it open for everybody, so your research will merge more seen, you will be more cited, and uh, so this is much more appealing for you as long as you pay for your paper. And this was very appealing for researchers because, uh, uh, but this has a problem, uh, which is uh, we can end up on the other side of the spectrum, which is, uh, review the, the review process has turned to be so easy and so uh, undemanding that you end up with bad science at the end of it so this also happened because there is um, a, too much pressure on the researchers to publish and this is so because the re rewarding system of academic careers are based on the quantity of the papers that you publish and not on the quality of your papers. And this brings you, for instance, when Higgs, that discovered the particle, the, the, the boson, when he won the Nobel Prize, he gave an interview to the Guardian Journal in English, what do you say? My luck in life was that I found this particle because otherwise I would be the shame of my department because I have spent 20 years thinking about science and how to get there. And I have published very little papers. So it turned out to be okay, but it is very frustrating for many colleagues that we are obliged and pressured to publish so much and we don't have time to think anymore about research that is needed, research that is sexy, research that uh, is much more appealing. No, we just go on and on and on producing meaningless research because it's an easy way to get more publications. So. This is one of the aspects that are driving the uprising of so many publications that in many times have quality, but they don't have any utility. Um, so this has to do with the, um, the publishing industry, as I said, that is now dividing in open access or classical journals. But even in classical, I mean, the, the publication world is a very funny business. Do you know any business where the production is assur assured by the consumers, paid by the consumers? Uh, and uh, so you you pay for your research. It, it, it is called the, the it, it is very daunting. It is called the, the, the perversion of inertia because uh, public money, usually public money, funds the, the research. Researchers with public money pay for the publication. Libraries and academic libraries with public money sign for the publications. Papers are reviewed by consumers, which are other researchers that do it freely. And then, if you want a paper, you have to buy it and pay for it. And the profit goes for these major companies like Elsevier or Springer. You know, the, the, Elsevier, the Elsevier income per year is more than... 7 billion pounds. 
I had no idea. We we didn't saying. know the idea of the kind of money that is involved in, in, in this type of thing. So so it's a uh, it's a very appealing business, and um, so they are responsible for the status quo of uh, too many publications, and you have to yes, find they, they news. Like let me just let, let me let me just finish. The other problem is on the academia, which pressure the researchers also to provide quantity over quality. And uh, and uh, so what I think will happen in a few years, and uh, is that you. I, I think these kind of publications, these traditional publications, are prone to disappear. Uh, what will drive the quality of the and the usefulness of research will be uh, will be electronic platforms where you can put your research in, and it will be your peers at the end of the day which is the number of downloads your paper will have because it interests other people that will make the importance of your of your research and uh, that's a very exciting side of it for me uh, it is um, uh, also just to finish and about academica there are many uh, persons today that feel that the, the rewarding system should change so we we cannot go on rewarding researchers uh, and academic progression based only on the quantity of papers that you publish but uh, you have to introduce the factor of the usefulness uh, how what what is a good paper what is a good clinical paper what is the major driving force for the utility and the usefulness and not the quality of the paper itself it's the kind of entropy changes that is going to provide to the current knowledge. If your paper is useful, it will provoke entropy on the vision knowledge. If your paper is very good, but is not useful, it will go without provoking any change on the entropy of the, the knowledge base. And that must be there. We must develop tools that can assess the usefulness of your research instead of the quantity of your research. Okay. So th th there's a lot of, of 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 very interesting things that you just said now. Uh, first of all, I had no idea uh, of, of of the business of publication. So basically, uh, in summary, all this government-funded money is using free labor so that these big companies make money, and that of free course, labor but... is basically the 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 referees and the and the and the researchers, these, the researchers, yeah. And all this money is transferred from the governments, basically, and from the funds to these private companies, right? Like Quintessence or Elsevier and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, and another thing, which is, uh, the, you said that in your point of view, in a, the ideal uh, structure would be to have electronic platforms that that the, the 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 popularity of your uh, or the value let's say of your research would be uh would be related to the number of downloads right of uh, for instance for instance but and the next question is about social media so but that means you you are giving a tool and you are hoping that the population will be able by themselves to judge the quality of something, right? So my question now is, so, so look at social media. Is that, is that what is happening? Or, or, I mean, do you mean that at the end of the day, uh, given enough time, the good thing will come to the surface? Or do you think that you have to have some sort of control? Because in social media, we are, we are going through it through, through sometimes that um, the algorithms, for example, I'm not sure if they bring up the, 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 
the best quality, let's say, you know. So my point is that people are highly manipulated, are highly manipulated by these algorithms. So I'm not sure that if you give, if you if you have a platform and if, if you let people from themselves just find themselves to decide what's the best evidence, I'm not sure if that um, if that is the best tool. I, I I don't know if I'm if this is the way that uh, yes, that you're uh, I know what you're saying, but what I well let me try. It. It's very interesting what the way you are putting it because. When we think about uh, knowledge platforms and uh, of free access, we think about peers going there to get the information they need. We don't think about general population, but of course, open science is open science. And uh, this is one thing that we cannot escape from, which is, uh, which is uh, uh, for instance, is in the European Union, there is this drive and this recommendation that all science must be made open in the next years and uh, weighting everything on the on the on the scale uh, at the end of the day the open access will win because people have the right to access science and and that will bring us to the social media in a moment because the cycle of knowledge is to end up in the population it's not to end up that's the uh, knowledge exists to make people's lives better and the the end destination of research is common people but there's a process and there is a cycle and th there are some aspects that this uh, I, I didn't bring about which uh, uh, are very appealing uh, in constructing these knowledge bases because one of the problems that we have now in, in science, also in research, is reproductibility and sharing of results. So when you access a paper now, presently, you don't have, you have access, you have access to the compiled data that the researcher is reporting. And there's a very big pressure now that you should make all your raw, what we call the raw data, what you found in your experiences and your research available to other researchers. So one of the advantage of those platforms is that you could have not only your paper, but also the raw data to share with other researchers. And that would make a, an open network for researchers to change knowledge in a more efficient way. That's what we think about when we think about uh, accessing knowledge platforms. I didn't think about it, the common people going there to, I think the medical knowledge for common people, which uh, in plain language must be worked for, I mean, uh, this is another topic which is very interesting. Is and this it's a challenge today. For instance, the Cochrane collaboration as uh, feels that it's very important to fight against uh, uh, doctors' uh, illiteracy, but it's also important to fight the common patient illiteracy. So we do this work in Cochrane, and for instance, we do this work in the, the, the Portuguese branch of uh, the, the Portugal branch of Cochrane, which is what we call plain language summaries, which is to go to the Cochrane reviews and transform the abstract in the plain language summary that is put in a special part of the website for common people to go in and get some information about medical stuff which is important but it's not at the same level because this is one problem that we also have today with patients it's patients are very different today from what they were decades ago because patients tend to have misconceptions about what it is uh, data information and knowledge these are three separate things that patients misconcept completely patients read one thing once and they think they have the knowledge to do and they discuss it and they want to discuss it with you on the same level and uh, this is very very challenging but um, social media for instance i think is very important 
to be to be able to enlighten patients in this way but uh, but uh, we have to be careful about it so uh you want me to talk a bit about social media it's uh Sorry. Yeah, I, 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 yeah. Well, uh, I think it's like a central topic today, especially in dentistry, because you were saying that the internet really made possible the widespread of evidence-based dentistry because databases were available. Um, yeah, but and I think that today um, social media is. I think that we are still still in the early years, and we are we are we are still trying to see, especially from a professional perspective. Um, how we would uh, uh, do the best use of that. Because of course that if you work in a private practice, of course that we all have to use it uh, from, a, from a private practice perspective. But um, for evidence-based dentistry, and uh, I, I do see a lot of colleagues that use social media to try to give proper and responsible and, uh, and uh, concise and important information for patients. And I think that's a very good use of, of social media, and that, that can be a very powerful tool. Uh, but there's, a, as we know, there's a lot of misinformation, and the way that the algorithms are done, it's it's, um, it's not only bringing up the the, the better information, the best information. So, as a researcher and as, as someone that 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 dedicates his life to evidence based dentistry, how do you look at social media? Um, from an evidence-based dentistry perspective, is it good? Is it bad? Uh, we still, or or it depends on the way that you use it. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I have very mixed feelings about social media. As a person, as a researcher, as an uh, an EBD researcher and champion, as I like myself to call, um, because uh, social media. Uh, I think are, well, you can't escape it, first of all. The question of the algorithms is the, uh, do not pertain really to the, 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 the tool in itself, but more to the people that manage those tools and where the intentions are, uh, commercially speaking. Uh, so, and, and I think that there's a lot of work to be done there. The simple concept of having uh, the old, were linked together on a space which in which everybody can uh, interact uh, freedomly uh, is very appealing to me. Uh, so uh, I think it's very interesting if you today you can have a space where you can talk to the world. But this introduces another problem, which is uh, the problem of immediate stardom, which is dominating the minds of too many people. So today you believe, not only you believe you can be a star overnight, which is true, but you are, many people are trying, are, are starting to drive their lives and their life concepts in the pursuit of searching of that stardom. And that is very dangerous. So generally speaking of the what is social media. But now for the, the evidence-based perspective, I think it's an excellent tool to disseminate good research. But once again, if we think, we must think on the terms of EBD users, not EBD doers. And EBD users must, one thing that, one thing that EBD users m must know and put in their minds is that seeing an author presenting a technique with one article as reference is not doing evidence-based practice or evidence-based dentistry. Evidence-based dentistry for users is to have powerful synthesis, like good systematic, and I mean good systematic reviews of polemic questions on the clinical field. Because 
the objective of a systematic review, the goal of a systematic review, is to provide a clinical recommendation. We now also see many systematic reviews of in vitro studies of uh, anatomical questions. Or that's not the 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 the, the goal of an of a systematic review. The goal of a systematic review is to take one focused question, which is polemic, whereas clinical decision is concerned, and to screen all the evidence that exists in every database in the world, say what's good, what's bad, what is needed, what is not needed, what, uh, what are the conclusions to take of this research that exists, and provide a recommendation with a knowledge base that is known to the one who reads it and can be reproduced by everyone that wants to reproduce that question, that search, and that work. So it's transforming opiniatic reviews that existed in very systematic and reproducible, in, which is in fact the, which it underpins sciences. Is it reproductive or is it not reproductive? And I think that social media can be can be a very powerful vehicle for disseminating because the objective of a resist of the evidence paradigm is to disseminate good um, clinical recommendations sound, based on very sound evidence to the clinicians. And uh, I think that social media uh, is a very powerful tool to do so. Um, but uh, the users must know that they should look for this type of publications and not thinking that when they are seeing uh, an author showing a technique, uh, because it, it also it is very appealing also for clinicians to go there, put their technique and say what we don't want to hear in the evidence paradigm, which this works in my hands. This is a, a sentence that we, we don't want to hear, uh, whereas uh, evidence base is concerned. Which, well, I've been doing this for 20 years. This works in, this works in my hands. So uh, it works. I'm telling you, I have these references that uh, defends it or that states it. That's not evidence-based dentistry. That is dentistry based on evidence, on one single evidence. And so that, uh, and, and, and we see a lot of that. We see a lot of that. And that is dangerous. But, but I, I think that now where, where the public is concerned, which is another story, uh, I think that uh, social media is very useful to fight uh, illiteracy. And I think that uh, dental associations worldwide must come to a sense that in the 21st century, you need different vehicles to spread knowledge and to inform your patients. And uh, because the, 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 the goal of knowledge, knowledge as a a life cycle now which with different different access points along the way knowledge starts in a laboratory or in a clinical room and uh, it can be assessed and discussed only by those who are researching this is the first point of the cycle the second point of the cycle is when you you try to tell it to your peers, you go to a congress and you show your research and you publish your research. That still can be assessed from in journals or conference proceedings by your peers. But that's not the goal of research. The goal of research and the goal of knowledge are the two next steps. The other one is generability which is your knowledge becomes so important that it goes into a textbook or into a knowledge base because it has been, now it is consensual to all your scientific community, okay? But the next step, which is the last one, is the more important, is popularization of knowledge. 
which is bringing the knowledge to the people. Sometimes that can be very fast. For instance, if tomorrow I discover the cure for AIDS, it will be popularized immediately because I will be on the news and the evening news telling I have discovered and everybody will know about it because it is so important. That happened with COVID, with the COVID vaccines, with the COVID process. But, and that's the goal of knowledge, is taking the knowledge from your lab to, or your practice to the people. And that is, there can be no more glory for a researcher that produces knowledge that can be popularized. Now, social media can be a means to popularize very effectively the knowledge to, to, to the people. And the, 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 the dental associations must have that in mind, that you, you cannot escape this type of, of, of vehicle. And when you think that, uh, no, 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 but uh, uh, knowledge is to be shared among peers and among practitioners, um, this is an old way of thinking. And it's not, it's, it's not right, it's not correct. You don't do science for your peers. You do science for the people. You do knowledge for the people. You do knowledge for bettering the people's lives. And uh, I think that, for instance, uh, and this has nothing to do with the evidence-based dentistry. I think that simply showing your cases on the on the on the on the social media can have a very powerful effect on uh, bringing the attention of your patients to their own health problems and uh, um, introducing in them the notion that can they can have different alternatives and contact with those alternatives and those choices and then of course go to a prediction and but uh, if uh, there was no social media this was a process that usually it will take much more time so uh, i think it it can be very helpful but it must be regulated as everything. And um, we must draw a line, what is publicity, for instance, and what is illiteracy combat, what she, but we have to, we as dentists and as a, a professional group must discuss these problems. We cannot, we can no longer be enclosed with ancient dogmas uh, and uh, misconceptions and uh, and uh, and trusty thinkings about uh, about new technologies because uh, the world is progressing i mean and we have to go along with it. and and the 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 next question is also uh, about something that it's not regulated yet so artificial intelligence and and big data and um, but how? What is your opinion of how uh, artificial intelligence and big data is is already or will influence medicine and and dentistry? Um, this is a very interesting topic. Also, <laughs> this is a very interesting so, so conversation. You, you, sorry, Antoni. You see that we are dropping all the bombs on you at the same time, right? So. <laughs> yes, but uh, we are we uh, are attacking no, but, you basically. No, no, no. I no, mean, no, it, it's, it's it, all these all these questions. They are tough ones. I mean, this is not like a yes or no. I mean, you, you have to elaborate a lot, and so thank you for that. But we, yes, we are dropping all the bombs on you. I'm I, I, I'm hoping I'm meeting your expectations uh, on my answers, but uh, and giving interesting answers because these are of really course, interesting topics. Course. Um. There is a difference. Uh, I'm very glad that you have made this difference on big data and uh, and AI because there are really different things. One is has been around for much much longer than the other. Um, I, I will start by speaking a bit of uh, of big data, big data, and the sense we can. So having that is the other disrupt. The first disruption that the. the I say, when I speak about digital medicine, there are three moments that are very disruptive. 
uh, for me in the past years that I uh, consider to be very disruptive. The first is the internet in itself that enabled to construct databases of knowledge, of medical knowledge, which everybody can assess. It enabled the evidence paradigm to be disseminated, to get to everybody. This was very important and very disruptive. The second is big data. Big data is possible because, uh, because of supercomputing. And supercomputing and the, the ability to manage large quantity of data uh, has enabled us to make sense of things that we knew and we tried to master it for many years. For instance, we have discovered how to sequence DNA in the we discovered DNA in the 50s, in the 60s and 70s, we know how to sequence DNA. We had this human genome project, but we didn't have computers who were, which were powerful enough to make sense of all the data that was generated by, by, these, uh, by these techniques. And what big data enabled us to do, which is very disruptive, is to be able to make uh, sense of all the physiological data that we have access today. So all these ohms that we have, the microbiome, the, 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 the metabolome, that we can now see how cells talk to each other, how the molecules are expressed that enable cells to talk to each other. For instance, this is only an example, I will give others of the applications of big data, which are very disruptive. Will can help us make sense of how our physiological complexity is working uh, on a real time. Uh, and this, this, this is very important this, because this is going to enable personalized medicine. So to know a human being uh, as a single unit, uh, which is uh, uh, how is it working, how is, are its characteristics and make sense of all this uh, astronomic quantity of data that it produces. So this, this is very disruptive and it's very important. But it's not only. Um, today we have the notion that uh, uh, health records, uh, electronic health records are being developing, are developing very fast. Uh, and that will help us to make sense of uh, that will completely change the way we do clinical research. One of the problems of clinical research is uh, that it has very limited external validity. When I was talking at the beginning of the, our session, saying that uh, one thing we want to know is uh, to whom these results will apply. What is the kind of patients, the nature of the patients or the settings or that these results can be applied to. This is, this is um, one of the great handicaps of clinical research because clinical research, which is traditionally done in academic settings or hospital settings, which are settings that are very different from the common setting, you choose your patients very well. You treat your patients in a very special manner. These patients are treated by ugly expert clinicians. And at the end of the day, you have spent a lot of money to produce research in a setting with a patient and then by a researcher that doesn't exist elsewhere, but only on that setting. So the external validity, and that's one of the problems of the randomized clinical trials, is that you spend a lot of money to get to a conclusion to, that can be applied to a very narrow set of patients. Now, with big data and good electronic records, and by good electronic records, we mean that 70% uh, uh, of the patients nowadays carry their own clinical data with them. They are going to measure it on real time from the moment they are born to the moment they will die permanently, the Apple Watch, with get your heart rate and that this is all clinical data that is being stored and it's meaningful on every patient. When you go to a chat on the internet, to the Facebook and you say, I'm taking this medication, it's giving me a headache that I've never experienced is a clinical data, which is on. So this is what we now call real world evidence. 
real-world data to produce real-world evidence. And what, uh, what the big data will enable us to do is to compile this evidence and to construct these very large health data sets and to go and get this data and produce evidence without the need to recruit patients to do specific clinical. Uh, so I, I think that the, the randomized clinical trial, for instance, will not exist like in 10 years. So, and, and if you see you have in Europe now, you have more than 100 new companies that are, um, their focus is on getting health data. So when, for instance, the, every each one of us in our clinical practice is sitting on a gold mine which are the health electronic records of our patients and uh, the thing that uh, this new legislation this new rule of law that we have concerning the protection of data has been uh, brought together by the european union having in mind that this data must be protected because of the, whom the whom is going to have profit on them and how and who, who do who do they belong to? So these are very important questions that need to be sort of. Uh, but uh, you are now starting to see many publications uh, trying to not to recruit patients but trying to get to results upon based upon these very large health data cells now there are problems there is still a great heterogeneity because you cannot do what we call in science a fishing expedition which is getting a lot of data and try to make sense of it now still you cannot undermine the scientific process which is depart from a good question so you have to have a good question to start with uh, but uh, i think there's a lot of potential in big data and i think the the, the the and when we when we talk about personalized medicine which is surprising and it's a very hot topic uh, people also have a misconception about it what big data will enable uh, pertaining to personalized medicine people often think that uh, personalized medicine is a medicine that uh, it, I will have my only disease and the doctor will have a only cure for me, a single cure for me that is not personalized medicine. What personalized medicine is about is, I thought I was unique, but with big data, the thing I thought was rare in me, in fact, occurs in 80,000 patients around the world, which is how algorithm can get place and makes statistical meaning um, of all this data that when a person is isolated is very rare. So where in which data set, health data set, can I be included as a person? So this is personalized medicine. And so big data is very important. Artificial intelligence is another different thing. And, uh, but it's very, well, when I think about AI, we, we must think about 10 years, 50 years, 100 years, and 1,000 years forward. That's what an exercise that I like to do imagine. So like in 10 years, I think what will happen is AI will help us to in diagnosis procedures that is occurring very fast. And, and uh, uh, we have talked a lot about AI in other fields, and uh, uh, we have the the, the the sensation that uh, medicine was being left behind and it was true because what I told uh, some minutes ago that nobody wants to put the investors, doesn't want to put money in something that is so uncertain as the health procedures and the health flow. Uh, so uh, uh, what do you think is a good performance for a machine on diagnosing? 80% right, 90% right? So it's very demanding and it's very variable. So it's very uncertain and nobody wants to put money in it. But now we are really feeling that we are coming to a point where AI is really going to enter the medical field and is going to change it. And that thing, uh, it's the, the, the third disruptive part of the digital movement 
the third moment is going to occur is uh, artificial intelligence and the way doctors communicate with patients. And that started with this concept of smart health that was driven by or introduced by Steve Jobs once again. Steve Jobs was a man that uh, had the, the vision uh, 50 years ago or 40 years ago that uh, people would need to use computers in their homes. And not much before he dies, he had this another vision, which is no, no, people will want to have a computer in their pockets for their daily performances. And that can be done with these phones. So the iPhone and the smartphones have enabled this concept of um, smart health that is a very powerful tool that closes the link in communication between patients and doctors. Uh, and uh, from there, this AI uh, part in medicine starts to develop very fast. So this is very exciting and it's very promising. What I think will happen in the next years is that we will develop um, very helpful tools for diagnosing. Uh, the human eye uh, and the human mind uh, can be trained to see small difference in radiographs or RMIs or whatever. But uh, for instance, many times you go to, to a center you do RMI, then you want to a second opinion, you get there, they want to do RMI on their machines. Again, because they are, they are used to diagnose it with that kind of image, which is different from the other. But a machine will do that perfectly, despite the, the machine where it's done. The, so, so AI will be very powerful in the next few years in diagnosing. That will be the first step. The second step I will think will be the bots, the chat bots, the bots you, you will have uh, virtual uh, receptionists. You, are, you now have programs for dental reception already. You, you will have, uh, you will have uh, programs which will assist you. There, there is a very interesting experience in one of American universities, they have developed this bot, this chatbot, this artificial, like an Alex or like a Siri, which is um, which is uh, uh, a nurse that can take that you. Which is a program which you install. It's, it was a pilot project uh, for oncological patients, uh, and you install it in your computers and it goes through all your system, your phone, your computer, and so you are a cancer patient, and uh, so you are on the internet, you talk to your nephew, and then you go through your photographs, then you go to the park and you feed the ducks, and then you come home and you start to feel depressed, and this program comes on and say, look, why are you depressed? I mean, look, Moments ago, you were feeding the ducks in the park and uh, you talked to your nephew today. So you see life is not so bad. And so when you propose this to patients, patients, you know, this is a very artificial stuff, a program telling me that, no, I don't want this. But the ones that went for it start using it repeatedly and increasingly. And their levels of quality of life have increased because um, this program does never get tired of recording of taking care over you at 4 a.m., 3 a.m., 2 a.m. And so I think this kind of uh, AI will develop very fast and uh, very short. Then we don't know what, to, when, we spark, when we speak about artificial uh, AI and uh, these, uh, these servers, I mean, uh, I once listened to an engineer an engineering faculty teacher or professor speaking about uh, so we are now creating uh, silicio uh, transformers so we we are we are carbon transductors of information and we are now uh, learning how to make silicio transduction of information every, everything will mix together 
and uh, we don't know which will be one. This has already started. We are incorporating parts of them, of the machines in us, and machines will incorporate our parts. But what we call artificial intelligence is just a name for intelligence. Intelligence is intelligence. And we don't know uh, what kind of emotion intelligence, if we put ourselves now 50 years or 100 years or 1,000 years further, what will happen? Uh, can the can the the machine completely replace the doctor? Can he can the machine develop this kind of emotional feeling that we are talking about that we don't know how uh, uh, an older clinician has this flair of sensing things and knowing? No, no, it's what you call the X factor, the human factor. Will a machine be able to develop? And if yes, what would you prefer? You are on, you are driving the road at 3 a.m., you have an accident, you go to a hospital. Do you prefer to be seen or diagnosed by a doctor that is working 36 hours in a row, or do you prefer to go and be diagnosed with a highly performant machine? that can sense and that the same type of flair that that the human has but never gets tired so you 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 really don't know what's going to 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 emerge and to the question that uh, do you think that the machine will be able to re completely replace man i usually answer that question to my students and we think, do you believe in God or do you don't believe in God? Because if you don't believe in God, then you think that physiology and your soul is just the replication of or the product of biochemical processes, electrical process, and that can be reproduced and that will be reproduced. And for those, I accept that they believe that machine will be able to replace the man completely. But if you believe in God, then there is something else that I have the extra flair that cannot be reproduced. And for those, I have very difficulty for believers, uh, and I'm a believer, I'm a religious person, and uh, I have certain doubts that uh, this kind of uh, performing conscience can emerge. Because if it can emerge, then we be playing gods ourselves. Because we have created a machine that is senescent and that is a being in itself. And which brings us to another question, which is, so we are making these machines to work for us at no cost. When machines become senescent, and we'll, we will have created senescent beings that will work, work for us at no cost. So we will be enslaving machines, senescent machines and beings to work for us. So we'll be very different gods for the, from the gods that we believe in, which are gods of love and gods of providence. We will be gods of uh, a very bad uh, intimacy. So uh, I think this question of the AI is very interesting. Uh, there are very many dangers because uh, it can completely escape our control. And uh, if you see the, if you have seen the, the conference by Yurval Arura, it's very interesting because Language is what makes us different from the rest of everybody, everybody, everything else on earth. It's our language. But uh, a supreme being more intelligent than us will be, will have the need to use a completely different language that we won't master. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, playing tricks, wanting to be God can turn, can really explode in our face and is completely controlled and we're being dominated by losing this sense of language that we have or by multiple languages. So uh, it's a very interesting, uh, but um, in the immediate future, I don't think it will happen. 
but I think we do have this very interesting tools that we that will help us to make better diagnosis. And the five areas that are thought will be the very hot topics in dentistry for the, the next years will be rapid prototyping, uh, augmented reality and virtual reality, personalized medicine, telemedicine, and big data and AI. So these are really the fields that uh, uh, integrated with each other for instance the the, the artificial intel the, the augmented reality and the the virtual reality will they be not only be able to uh, also be a vehicle to to substitute the 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 doctors but for instance the professor at the universities how will augmented reality and uh, virtual reality cope with uh, the future of teaching in, at universities, for instance, clinical teaching. Can it change it? I mean, we have to wait and see.